All right, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, so welcome to the second of three webinars that the PD Green program is doing uh, for the spring 2020 Justice Education Series. Uh, so my name is Mako uh, Faniel. I'm the Director of Tutor Training and Justice Education for the PD Green program. And uh, tonight we are here uh, to be in conversation uh, about uh, COVID-19 and its impact on uh, incarcerated folks, but uh, also on uh, prison education, all right? So we're here tonight to, uh, I would say to do three things, to remember, to understand, uh, and to recommend. And so uh, we want to remember where we were uh, last year when COVID-19 began to rapidly spread and shut down life as we knew it. We also uh, want to understand, you know, what that was like for incarcerated people and those involved in educational programs. Uh, we want to uh, understand how educational services continue for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. And finally, we want to make some recommendations about how to prioritize system impacted people and incarcerated learners and our solutions about the global pandemic. And so uh, before our panelists help us understand and recommend, I want us to take a brief moment uh, to remember. And so uh, this past weekend, uh, I was watching uh, TV. So I was taking a break, I wasn't working, which is, you know, can I get some uh, hand clap for that? Uh, so I was watching the NBA All-Star Game. And as I was watching that, I remember that on this day last year is when the NBA uh, canceled its season. And I was in group chats with my friends at that particular time. And we were saying, oh, this is really real if the NBA is, is stopping. Uh, that, that was one of the things that kind of made it real for us. And then uh, over the last week, I've been watching episodes of this show called Queen Sugar, which comes on own. Uh, and it's helping me remember the fears that we had at this time and the calculations that we were making about COVID-19. Uh, and then I also remember that uh, in, in two days from now will be the one year anniversary uh, from when uh, the uh, police department in Louisville, Kentucky uh, went inside of, of uh, Breonna Taylor's home and, uh, and murdered her. And, uh, and you know, a month later, or a month or two months later, we began learning about that. And it begins like another iterations of, of, of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so um, about this time last year, the PD Green program, we paused programming. Uh, we stopped going inside of jails and prisons, providing educational support uh, for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated learners. Uh, we stopped doing uh, the on-campus events that, that, that we were doing. Students got, uh, began to get sent home. And so we actually began reimagining at this particular time, how do we continue to live out our mission and, and, uh, and, and pursue our vision? And um, most of us, you know, thought that it would be two to six weeks. You know, that's what our local and federal government uh, and state governments were telling us. But here we are uh, a year later. And there have been, uh, as of yesterday, about 30,000 uh, people that in the United States that have been infected with the coronavirus. And about 300,000 of those 30,000, uh, of, of those uh, 30 million were incarcerated persons. Okay. And... Uh, as of yesterday, the last count, there's been a half a million deaths. And about 2,500 of those deaths have been incarcerated persons. And so as we remember, I want us to take uh, a few moments, uh, about uh, like, I don't know, 15 uh, to 20 seconds, uh, to take a moment of silence uh, to remember uh, that, uh, like what we have, like those lives that we have lost, uh, and, you know, and also just kind of like what we have lost. All right, I um, hope we took deep breaths and not uh, as my uh, 
yoga instructor would say, take some deep breath, not shallow breaths. So, uh, there's a lot to take in. Um, so to help us, uh, Marie, you can go to the next slide. To help us uh, to continue to remember uh, and to help us understand and make uh, some recommendations. This afternoon, we have three persons who were under correctional supervision, uh, whether that was being incarcerated or uh, on a probation or parole uh, in a halfway house uh, when uh, COVID hit and then were released uh, last fall. And we also have two people from organizations who provide educational support uh, to incarcerated learners. And so to moderate our panel tonight, uh, we have Anthony Landers. Uh, Anthony is a formerly incarcerated uh, graduate student at Rutgers University uh, who is working on a wonderful uh, research uh, project uh, that's looking, uh, that's uh, trying to understand uh, the experiences of incarcerated folk and formerly and uh, people that were released uh, because of the, the New Jersey's compassionate release uh, and uh, education credit uh, program. And so I will put you in the hands of Anthony, who will then go ahead and, um, and introduce our panelists and uh, start us off. Right on, thank you, Mako. Hello to everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. Again, my name is Anthony. Um, I've had the pleasure to collaborate with PD Green Program and Mountain View Community uh, ever since I moved here two years ago uh, from the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, I was working with the Berkeley Underground Scholars at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm really excited to be here and I'm most excited to introduce the panelists uh, who are five amazing scholar activists. Um, so I'm gonna start off with the first three panelists who were formerly incarcerated and recently released during the pandemic. I'm start off with Nicole Gaillet, a uh, current student at Rutgers University studying criminal justice and peace and conflict studies. During Nicole's 12 year prison sentence, she achieved a GED associate's degree, started her VA studies and volunteered for the Project Pride program where she used narrative therapy to help youth. As an NJ STEP student, she developed a passion for social justice. She recently worked with NJ Prison Justice Watch to help pass S2519, which required compassionate release and special time credit for incarcerated people during the global pandemic. Our second panelist is uh, another recently returned citizen and NJ STEP student, Richard Gonzalez. Richard is a third year student at Rutgers University, majoring in social work. Richard was incarcerated during the pandemic and was released under the new law uh, awarding special time credits. Richard hopes to use his experience in prison and education to promote the systemic changes needed to bring true justice in the criminal legal system. Our third panelist is Michael Butler. Michael Butler is the Workforce Development Industry Relations Coordinator for the Institute for Community Justice in Philadelphia. While incarcerated, Michael provided reentry support services to other incarcerated persons. Michael envisions a world free of incarceration where communities have equitable access to health, safety, justice, and the opportunity to design freedom. Our fourth panelist is Norma Donaraj, Regional Manager for the Washington DC Office of PD Green Program. Growing up in Wheaton, Maryland with immigrant parents, Norma has been serving marginalized communities for nine years through program development, counseling, and community organizing. She previously worked with commercially sexually exploited youth in New York City and went on to serve in the office of the mayor in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Norma also has a master's degree in social work. And for our final panelist, Alan Walkendorfer, program associate with the Vera Institute of Justice since 2018, as the co-author to a published article titled Lessons from Second Chance Pill a toolkit for helping incarcerated students complete the FAFSA. Allen's work focuses on expanding access to post-secondary education in prison and overturning the ban on Pell Grants for people incarcerated in state and federal prisons. Allen is also a founding member of Nation Outside where he now serves as a board chair. He earned a BSW from Eastern Michigan University and an MSW from the University of Michigan. As we can see, we all have a, a wealth of power and knowledge for y'all today. Uh, to the panelists, thank you all for sharing your time, your energy, and your expertise with us. 
we're all really excited to kick this conversation off today. Thank you. All right, without further ado, let's get started. Um, so my, my, first three, uh, my first three questions are for Nicole, Richard, and Michael. Um, and to begin, I wanna take us back to Mako's introduction. Um, about a month before the nation went on lockdown, we learned about how the virus moved, who it impacted in the areas in the world where infections were rising. Then in March, the US went on lockdown. So to start us off, I'm hoping that you can further introduce yourselves um, and specifically focusing on uh, your engagement with educational programs, reentry programs, and take us back to when COVID first hit. Uh, what were you hearing? Where were you? And what was going on at the time? Nicole, uh, feel free to start us off. Um, thank you for that great introduction and everybody hi today. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, so my experience with education on the inside, um, education was a way out for me. It was a way for me to not be confined. And um, I knew that I was incarcerated, my body was incarcerated, but when I pursued education, when I went to go get my GD, when I went to go get my associates, and so on and so forth, it was just a way for me to be free. It was a way that they couldn't hold, that they couldn't incarcerate. They couldn't incarcerate my mind. They could keep me there all they wanted, but my thoughts were free to be whatever they wanted to. So it was a way for me to escape. So um, I continued with the NJ STEP program and um, obtained my associates. Then I went on to pursue my bachelor's degree in justice studies. Then um, I came out and went to um, the halfway house where I continued my education there through the MVC program at Rutgers Newark. And I switched over to criminal justice and minored in peace and conflict studies. Um, so a lot of our education in there was focused around um, different bouts of activism and political science. And I ended up finding a real passion for um, for social justice and have been impacted by the system and seeing all the things that were wrong with the system that I thought were okay um, made me find a passion for it and um, wanted me to help others I was leaving behind. Um, when COVID first hit, I was in the halfway house. I was still incarcerated. And at first, um, none of us like took it really seriously. Um, we didn't think it was like a real thing. And it was like, oh, you know, and then when people started dying on the outside and family members and then um, people on the inside started dying, um, it hit hard. It was really scary. Um, it was a paralyzing kind of fear because um, there was not much we could do. Um, we had no control over anything and even less control over our circumstances. And there was no way to um, social distance or do any of the things that they um, use hand sanitizer. Like, um, you know, I don't know if everybody knows, but a lot of things aren't afforded to us in prison, um, like hand sanitizer or bleach, things that you may consider as, you know, regular things um, we can't have in there. So um, we had no way to properly sanitize and um, no way to social distance, living in close living quarters, um, using the same um, bathrooms. And um, it was just really hard um, other than that on our emotional mental health because um, our families on the outside, us on the inside, we didn't know if we were going to, um, if this was you know, gonna kill a lot of us in there. and. Um, it was really scary to, you know, you never think about, you know, going in prison and, you know, even people with long sentences, um, you don't think about dying in prison. So when COVID hit, it was like, this is a very real possibility. And um, it stunned my education. I wasn't able to go um, to school anymore to attend Rutgers um, until they ended up working so we could do it online. But until then, um, our 
education was stagnated and it was really depressing because that was, like I said before, that was my way to escape my circumstance. That was a way for me to elevate above it and become something else other than the number, other than um, that stigma that surrounds people incarcerated. So, and then just to see, you know, how many, you know, I knew two of the women that died in the, in prison, in the prison, and um, the only women's prison in New Jersey, I knew both of them, and it was just so, like, I just seen them, and it was just, like, so sad, it was like, I can't believe this is really happening, this is really life right now, and um, um, yeah, that was just, um, it was just really hard, that's all I have. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Michael, Richard, feel free. Uh, sure, so um, thank you for having me on. Um, definitely have experience with Peter Green when I was in prison. They used to come in and provide tutoring services to the students and, and I work with them, so I'm happy to be part of this. Um, just like Nicole, when I was in prison, like when the New Jersey State program started, the college program was a lifeline to me. Um, I had a high school diploma, so there was nothing else really for me to do in prison other than vocational programming, which didn't interest me. So there was nothing else for me to do. It wasn't until the, the prison allowed the New Jersey State program to operate that I felt, well, this is my opportunity, this is my chance, and I jumped right into it, and I never looked back. And it was a life changing, and it's I think it saved my life. And it definitely, like Nicole said, it took me outside of the prison. When I was in the classroom, I wasn't a prisoner anymore. I wasn't an incarcerated person. I was a student. I felt free. I felt like I'm in the actual college class. And this was not, I wasn't in a prison. I wasn't being held. I was a regular student and we were having our discussions. We would talk about professors and it was just a great learning experience. And I, and I still, to this day, you know, miss that. You know, even out here going to classes, it's not the same being in this, inside of a classroom. Um, so it was a life altering experience. Um, when when COVID came, I thought it was, we all thought it was gonna be like the swine flu or West Nile or something that comes, well, it's, in, it's beginning in China, it's not gonna reach here, it's not real. This is something that we don't have to worry about. And it wasn't until literally the March on a Friday, everything was fine. On Monday, the prison was on lockdown. It happened that quickly. At Friday, we were in school on Friday. I worked in the education department and I was able to be there seeing the process like, no, we're gonna have school on Monday and Monday was all shut down. Um, it was such a scary time because um, we, that's like Nicole said, we, like, we weren't allowed to even wear masks in the beginning because they were like, how can you wear a mask? We need to see your faces, match your ID. You can't walk around a prison without, with mask on. Um, definitely didn't have like enough cleaning supplies. Um, our, our bathroom situation was terrible. And how can we socially distance when the prison was so packed? Like it's literally, there was never any space to be six feet apart. All the cells, the prison I was at was designed for one person is all made into double cells, double bunks. So it was definitely a packed prison. And it was just, you know what I mean? That we felt like fearful of men that I've been in prison with for years. And, but I don't want to even speak to them or shake their hand or be near them because of COVID. It definitely alienated us from each other too. Um, and to see like, like once they did mandate masks, it wasn't enforced by the officers. The officers wouldn't wear masks. We were scared of them. They were scared of us. Um, and it was like the, the lockdown was terrible. I was in a dorm unit and they basically locked us in the dorm unit once we started contracting COVID and the whole unit basically got it. And they just left us there. Like if the only time you would leave the unit was you had to be dying. Like the, the men that left that unit, out of the five that left in gurneys, three of them died from my unit and to never come back. 
And and we saw them walking down, you know, getting rolled down the compound. We never saw them again. And it made it real to us. Yes, this is a life-threatening disease. This is something that is affecting us all. We didn't even know how much it was affecting other prison until later that we found out that everyone had it. It was just, it just went like wildfire throughout the prison. And um, like the, the 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 New Jersey step had to stop because they're coming in as volunteers. The professors would come in and they're not staff of the prison. So it, all school programs shut down, including the college programs. Um, it, it's, it was allowed to continue through the JPay system, which is our communication system. And it was through emails, but it didn't, it didn't work out well. It's like, how can we speak to the professor, send an email, wait back a week, because the prison has to check the email before we send it, and they're gonna have to check it when it comes back to us. And it was like a disconnect. And also, like I said, the class discussions were really needed. That's, you know, most of the stuff was, I learned from other, the other men that was in prison with me. It, it, it that did not work well. And it was very difficult to finish the semester without, um, without that. It was, I finished, but for us, we, you know, we understood that we couldn't have it, but it, we also, that doesn't mean that we liked it any much, any better than what we had. Thank you. Um, well, first off, uh, I wish, you know, um, Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania uh, DOC um, had an opportunity to give education like you guys get in Jersey. I, I mean, I wish because for so long, um, being incarcerated, I didn't have that. I didn't, um, I didn't see that. Um, it took me a long time to be able to to get in my brain that I could be more than a person that has been incarcerated with a felony. So, you know, I wish we could have that opportunity in Pennsylvania. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I also started, helped start an organization inside of SCI Phoenix, which is in Pennsylvania, um, called Man Up. And um, if you can imagine 400 men in a room, communion, like, you know what I'm saying, like close together and becoming a family, um, envision that. Um, it doesn't happen anywhere that I've ever seen um, where you talk about some of you know, the most notorious people from the streets and inside of prison coming together in a format like that. And um, it started off as a self-awareness type of thing, but then it evolved into an aftercare, which is where I came in at, um, as far as re-entry. And um, by doing what I did for Man Up, the DOC, and they, they saw that I had that skill and they basically hired me to become a re-entry specialist for them as well. So seeing, you know, how you bring joy to a person's life when you talk about connecting someone to society because, you know, at times we feel like we're ghosts, right? Like society doesn't see us because we're behind the wall. So being able to bring people from society inside of a prison and, and telling men that you have support when you get out of prison is it's a big thing. It's almost like what you guys explain about education, um, seeing that there's a light at the end of the tunnel that you could be something totally different. Um, so then COVID hits and you're talking about a whole jail, the, the impact, the energy of a, a jail when my program is up, how it changes the, the atmosphere, um, people are, you know, speaking to each other, people have smiles on their faces, to that just being gone, to, to not having any connection at all and being stuck in a cell is one of the most horrible feelings that I've ever experienced in my life because I was directly inside when it happened. Um, I've been released from prison for seven months now, um, but before the pandemic, I was able to network and be able to uh, network myself into where I'm at right now as far as the Institute for Community Justice and to be able to get the position that I have as well. Um, but like I said, everyone does not have that ability. So during COVID, when it first hit, I could say that, you know, 
as far as the lockdown goes, Pennsylvania took it very seriously because I feel like in Pennsylvania, it is all about punishment, but that's another panel and another discussion. Um, but they did uh, lock us down. They, we didn't have a problem with putting a mask on because they locked us down in the cell for 24 hours when it first happened, but they did give us, you know, <clears throat> masks and things like that. So if you can imagine, uh, Richard spoke about being in a cell that's made for one person. Um, that's what it is. It's always going to be a place that's made for one person. And now having two people in a cell that never leave at all, being fed, being given mail, um, getting a phone call. You can't even go out and get a phone call. And when it first hit, we couldn't even shower for the first couple of days, for at least five days. So now we're talking about sanitation and, you know, cleansing and cleansing, cleanliness issues as well. So you have that. And then we just don't know what's going on. Like a lot of us felt that um, they were over, they were blowing it, like blowing smoke up basically our, you know, our butt, like lying to us about it because they were trying to do something else because, you know, what we saw on TV it was basically saying it was a hoax or it's not that serious. So we took it that way because that's some of us, our only connection to the outside world is the media. So now being locked in a cell for 24 hours for at least 14 days straight when it first hit, um, it's definitely, it definitely changed a lot. Like you had people that committed suicide. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, they were supposed to have services for the counselors to come around, but they didn't really do their job. Um, and in Pennsylvania, we have um, the peer counseling, and that just totally stopped. So the people that you were, you know, close to, to talk to, that could probably get to you, they were locked in a cell as well. So then you still have the process. People were still going home during COVID. So reentry services stopped. You know what I'm saying? So those job connections stopped. Uh, those places to live, they stopped. Um, sometimes people got held up because the bed date got stopped because now you had to go through a process of getting a test and it took seven days for a test to get back. So now there's COVID, you're stuck in a small place and now they're not even letting you out because they say you have to get a test to get out. So now the mental is, is going crazy now. So, um, I mean, I have some, you know, more things to, you know, speak about. I'm not sure you'll get to that later, but just wanted to give you like a, a, a little bit of an insight of what was going on when it first happened with me. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I do actually want to, I think it's a great time to get to that discussion um, in this framing of, of lockdown, right? And what it means for folks um, who are incarcerated and, and folks who are out here, right? It means two different two completely different things. And I also want to get to this notion of the inability to social distance while in prison. Um, so as a follow-up question uh, for Nicole, Michael, and Richard, um, I want to, uh, so thinking back on, uh, or I want to introduce a little bit of information from one of the staffers from the PD Green program, Amanda Klonsky, who penned an article for the New York Times, where she argued that because of overcrowding, sharing of space and resources and the inability to social distance, jails and prisons were not only a dangerous place to be during the pandemic, but also that they would be the epicenter for the virus. A year later, we know that sadly this prediction came true uh, as you all have, have spoken about. And so my question is, um, let's extend on um, our, your previous answer and tell us what the response was from administrators and tell us about what lockdown means for you all and how it impacts education and reentry services. Um, so um, lockdown is very different from what ex people experience from here to the outside. Um, I remember um, somebody saying to me when I was in prison, um, during the whole coronavirus, oh, now I know how you feel. And I felt so insulted because how can you possibly compare that to how I feel? Like the lockdown you experienced with COVID is only a little bit of, you know, 
of what it is to be locked down in here. It can't, it just can't compare, right? You can go out, you can um, buy your own groceries, you can social distance, you could walk away from people if you wanted to. Um, you know, you have more autonomy to do other things and um, that we don't have that I'm not allotted to. So, um, and I try to explain that to people. Um, so, the social distancing um, in prison, prison settings, halfway houses, um, they weren't made for that. They weren't made to make you feel comfortable, to give you your space. Um, they were made for confinement in closed quarters. And I remember when, um, when people talked about social distancing and they try to say, oh, we need a social distance from, you know, um, they try to implement the social distancing in um, the halfway house and in the prisons. And it was like, but our toilets aren't even six feet apart. <laughs> you expect us to social distance our beds, our, but our toilets aren't even six feet apart. So it's um, an impossible thing to try and um, do the measures, um, the things they implemented on the outside to take precautions from COVID just um, were just not possible at all inside um, the prison system. So um, it was like, you know, it was, it, like I said, it was impossible. And um, being confined in there and education, like I said before, and I can't stress this enough, education was a way to liberate me. And, um, you know, going to school, even if it was going to school within the prison, you know, getting away and you couldn't do that anymore. And um, it just it just played a lot on um, the confinement of my mental and emotional health and as well as everybody. And um, the barriers that were, there was more barriers other than the ones we already had in place, um, we, which are so many as it is, and then COVID put any put more in. And people coming in from the outside, um, administrators and people who ran the halfway houses who came and implemented, you know, the COVID procedures or, you know, the, the standard COVID procedures, oh, wash your hands, social distance. And it's like, you don't make any sense. You know, you don't make any sense. Like, you know, um, so, but the implementations that were put in, even by the people um, that were running the halfway house when I was in there, you know, any other prison systems, it was like, um, they still seen us as other as another group of people they didn't see us as like okay so these um these procedures are okay for you under your circumstance but if they were implemented in my own life they would not be okay so um they didn't see us in the same capacity as other people and um you can tell by the things that were implemented by you know obviously um certain things pose a safety risk or even with the mask you know got to see your identity you can't you know disguise yourself in any way but when it comes to you know you're now you're saying that I don't I'm not good enough to live because I can't wear a mask because I can't have bleach because I can't sanitize my area properly or um you know have sanitizer because hand sanitizer because there's alcohol in it so now it comes to like a humanities issue and it was pretty clear i mean being incarcerated you see it right you see how you're you're less than and um for a while up until you know education um for me um it kind of felt normal it kind of felt regular you know until um like i said through education and through um, that I was able to overcome that and say like, yeah, this is not normal. No, this is not okay. No, these social systems aren't supposed to be like that because, you know, I made a mistake or I made a couple wrong turns in my life or no matter how big they were, um, is this is not okay. What you're doing to me is not okay. What you're doing to other people is not okay. So um, when COVID happened and I was already, you know, conscious of all that, it was like, I saw, um, how little we were valued and how um, less than they seen us. And, um, 
you know, the value on us, um, on our lives as humans um, just wasn't the same. And it was just reiterated back to me during those times um, by trying to implement um, outrageous um, things that just were impossible. So um, um, that's when I got connected um, um, through um, NJPW and um, I said, you know, we have to find a way to get out of here. They gotta be able to listen to us and understand that, you know, we're humans too. And, you know, if you were under these circumstances, it would be impossible. And, you know, everybody, there's nobody who hasn't made a mistake and nobody who hasn't made some wrong turns in their life. And it doesn't mean that we're any less, um, any less to be a, afforded life. We deserve a life any less than the next person. Um, and could you uh, repeat the question one more time? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what were the uh, administrative responses? And if you could talk, uh, break down more, you were mentioning about the lockdown uh, that you are going, going through. I'm wondering if you could expand that some more and specifically highlight how, you know, lockdown is different. Um, it's completely different when you're incarcerated? Yeah, um, so as far as the administration response, I think I spoke about it. Um, they completely locked us down. Um, like, no no rat about it, just locked us down. That was their response to put us in a cell and lock us down and really didn't explain anything about it. So um, you can imagine, I hear a lot of people speaking about mental health. Um, even those that um, don't have serious mental health issues probably, you know, got them during that time because, you know, we were locked down. Um, as far as um, what that entails, the difference of it, um, lockdown 24 seven is different from, you know, being told to go in at certain times and being told that you can come out. So usually in a day inside a prison, you're, you're really out about eight hours a day so now you don't even have that and you kind of get used to it it programs you if you've been in prison for a while you start to that's that's really what your life is that's your day you have an eight hour day so now they're taking that life away um so when you hear somebody make a comparison um about my situation and they're on the street it's, it's really no comparison because even though you're locked inside of your house you can go outside and smell the fresh air. You can um, take a walk around the block. Um, we literally can't do anything. So um, as far as what that meant during the lockdown, so you have to take legal visits away. There's no more legal visits. The court stopped. Um, you have to take regular visits. Now I can't see my family. They're gone. You don't even have the phone, right? That's gone as well. Um, as far as education, education was just gone. There was no education. Everything was stopped. Literally, the, the resources, the teachers, they used them to pass out food. You know what I'm saying? Like to pass out food. So, you know what I mean? They, it, there was no education. You just were sitting in your cell. They gave us free cable. Didn't have to pay for cable. They didn't have to pay for a tablet or nothing like that. They supplied it. So, they was basically giving you TV for education. Um, as far as equipment, cleaning equipment, masks, they gave us two masks and we had to keep washing them. And if you made your own mask, you can get rolled up for it because it was considered contraband. Um, let's talk about the COs and how they had to be professional and to you know protect themselves. You literally, they supposed to have gloves on when they pass our food out, they don't. Most of them didn't. They would come on our blocks, no mask on, you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't even enforced at times. So you, now you have people getting sick on a block that's already locked down. How do we get it? How did we get it? You know what I'm saying? So even the process of when someone catches it on a block, they literally wait. Like somebody said, I think Nicole said, or someone said, until you're extremely sick. I don't know if that was Richard, like, until you're extremely sick, like you literally have to be dying. And then when they come and get you, they basically make your life rougher. 
So not only are you locked down, now you don't have those amenities that you had. TV, tablet, not, no writing utensils. You're just in a cell looking at walls. So now the, men, the mindset was, if I'm not dying, I'm not even calling medical. You know what I'm saying? So people don't even want to call medical because of the process that they put you through when you go to get help. Because it's not really help. It's, it almost looked like a form of punishment. Um, as far as uh, how we got out when it, when it started to open up, we were in cohorts. So it started off with four cohorts and you only got 25 to 30 minutes out. You can't do too much in that time. There's no rec time. So if I go to the yard, then I got to sacrifice a shower. If I get in the shower, I might can't call my, my house. You know what I'm saying? So so imagine that for a person that's about to re-enter into society where this is the most critical time for him to be on the phone or her to be on the phone, to be basically doing that networking. That is cut totally out. Um, so, I mean, if that answered your question a lot more, It does. Thank you, Michael. Richard. Yes. Um, just like um, Nicole was saying, like people did try to compare this situation to my situation. People I know in my family. And I'm like, no, it's not the same thing. Like, if, and the, the, to the people that have been in prison before, one of the most important things in prison is count. Like they care about the count more than anything, counting bodies. And that's what prison is, counting bodies. How many bodies are in prison? And they take the count very seriously. When they closed that gate, it was three weeks that they did not do count. They didn't want to have any contact with us. Like we were the ones that that gave it to ourselves. Like, like Michael said, like we got it from them. Like we weren't, we're not the ones going inside and out the prison. They locked that gate and didn't come down again. And and I'm like Michael said, like the people that some people that got sick, they didn't say anything because. All they're gonna do is put you in an isolation cell. Basically, you're stripped naked, you're in your boxes in an isolation cell, being sick. And if you're sick enough, then they take you to the hospital where those guys that were that sick, most of them died. But um, the prison, like their, their procedures for dealing with was, was ridiculous. Like, like I said, they gave us two masks in the beginning. For a couple of months, that's the only mask we had. So we had to wash them, they got filthy, they were falling apart. Um, they, they started handing out more soap eventually once a week. It went from twice a week to once a week. Um, and when they began testing, um, they will put the people that test positive in the isolation unit, but leave their cellie in the unit. So the cellie that might be positive was still, that was in close contact with that person was still in the unit. Um, so yes, the, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't understand how they, like, they eventually started taking both persons out. But in the beginning, like, what was that about? That person might also have COVID, might be exposed, but you're still letting that person walk around with us, even though, like, we were on lockdown. And lockdown in prison is, means you're staying in your cell practically all day. We would come out, eat, go back, or not eat, grab our food, and go back and eat in ourselves. Um, there was no recreation. Um, psych the psych services was cut off. It was only for emergency services. It basically, I had to say, I want to kill myself to see a psychologist. Um, medical services wasn't operating unless it was an emergency. Um, so educational services was definitely cut off completely. Um, like for the high school students in the prison I was at, they began making packets for the students and they would pass it out to all the students to work on their own in the cell. But there was no access to, at that time, to a teacher or to any of the uh, um, student TAs that could help them because the rules that was instituted was only a certain limited amount of people could come out the cell at a time. And like Michael was saying, like and during that time, you gotta use the phone, take a shower and use the JPEG all in 20 minutes. With, a whole group of men. So either, either you pick one or the other, or a lot of fights happen because of that too, because there's a limited time and you have a certain amount of people that want to use this stuff. So what it did was create like more conflict in the prison that, that was already there. Um, the, 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 the administrators, they instituted these 
rules and they painted spots on the floor where we were supposed to stand. But how can you like do that in a prison where it's, you know, to me, prison is designed to pack people in. Like it's not designed for humans. It's just designed to pack as many people in as they can. And that was the point of the prison. But yes, it was definitely hard. And especially when we're fearful of the officers because they're coming in, they're coming in and outside of the prison and the mass mandate wasn't being used by them. They weren't, they were coming without mask on or having them, you know, up to their lips, but with their nose exposed. And guys keep, we kept on getting COVID. Like it kind of was a constant, it would go down and rise back up because it was just all this in and out of prison from the officers. Cause really the civilian staff was shut down. Like who else is bringing it into us? But yes, and education was like, that's one of the first things to go, unfortunately, is the education services. So, you know, I know the teachers wanted to be there and they did their best with their packets that they were making for the students, but it, it definitely was, it wasn't very beneficial to the students. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I wanna bring Norma and Alan into the conversation. Uh, you both are responsible for administering prison education programs. And so with a similar question, um, tell, us about, um, tell us about what the conversations were within your organization and the broader field of prison education regarding COVID-19 and how it would impact the work, focusing specifically on immediate challenges. Um, what support were you able to provide and how did it change the way you operated? So at the PD Green program, uh, we met as a bigger group of staff more often when the pandemic began, and we began to think um, openly and creatively. So we asked ourselves, how can we continue to serve incarcerated students um, and, in and students post-release? So we had to consider the safety of our students, the safety of our volunteers, and the safety of our staff. Um, and we were determined to have something in place uh, by fall 2020 because we understood that our students were being hit the hardest during the pandemic and we knew that there was a serious need for support. So in addition to supporting our students with their academic goals, um, we were, and building a transformational relationship with our students um, through their tutors, we know that uh, judges look at behavior first and the very next thing they look at is education. And so we knew that this would impact um, whether or not students may have uh, reduced sentencing, um, if they, whether or not they had the ability to continue on their education. Um, and so before the pandemic, we had already begun some conversations about expanding our program partners from just facilities to also working with reentry programs, but we quickly sped up this process in the face of COVID-19. Um, and we also began thinking about how to keep our supporters and volunteers engaged who are worried about our incarcerated students and were eager to stay involved. Um, so our staff shifted to focus on uh, revamping our volunteer trainings and brainstorming about the various aspects of infrastructure that we needed to have in place for virtual programming. Thanks, Norma. So I, I first wanna, just wanted to thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I'm, it's honored to be um, invited to this space, um, and I'm honored to be on this panel with you all. And I wanted to thank the panelists that you know have already spoken for sharing your experiences. I mean, it's, it's real, it's important, um, it's humanizing for people to hear this stuff. Um, but I know it was difficult. Um, yeah, I also wanted to just take the opportunity before I answer the question to just uh, you know, introduce myself a little bit um, more in depth um, and what brings me to this space. So, um, you know, I was mentioned already that I, you know, at Vera that we provide technical assistance to colleges and we work to expand access to post-secondary um, education. But, um, you know, what brought me to that work is that, you know, le leading up to that, um, you know, about a decade of addiction and uh, drug dependence in my life led me to prison myself about 14 years ago. Um, and I did time in Michigan at that time. There weren't no, there weren't any programs at all. Um, a few a few years after that, um, you know, Michigan started to be actually become one of the leaders with um, 
post-secondary education and vocational programs, but that stuff didn't exist at all. And so um, just wanted to put that perspective on it. Um, you know, eventually in my incar incarceration, I, I found long-term recovery that led me to social work. So I was happy to see uh, Richard on here um, studying social work too. Um, and then um, higher education and social work uh, led me to the world of advocacy, social justice, introduced me to all of that. Um, and that the formula incar former incarceration that I spoke of um, led me to this mission of ending mass incarceration, this system of perpetual punishment that exists. Um, and what um, many of the people on this panel have spoke of experiencing. And, um, and then that, that's what led me to this work at Vera. So which it, it gives me an opportunity to combine all of those experiences and all of that, that um, life knowledge and, and, and um, higher education knowledge into one, one place. So get, to get to the um, answer to the question, you know, of course, immediately it was immediate concern for the health and safety of the people that are incarcerated, you know, students, faculty, um, you know, our staff, like all of that, of course. Um, but this, all of this happened right at the same time that Second Chance Pell was expanding last year. Um, and on, and, and so, you know, our, our problem was sort of twofold because it became twofold because we had been anticipating like winding down our work with the, with the first cohort of Second Chance Pell sites that we had been working with for the prior few years. Um, and suddenly COVID happens. And so we had to shift gears and, you know, immediately get, um, start working with them um, to help them keep their programs going. Um, and at the same time, we had 67 new colleges coming in to Second Chance Pell during a pandemic. Um, and so we had to shift from um, a live onboarding process where we would have brought them all together and did some training and had a conference together. And we had to um, shift to, to sort of that, um, to an online modality. So, th so those are some of the immediate things that, that we were faced with. And um, I think, you know, I can get a little deeper into that, but I think, think that will come up in some of your next questions. Uh, so thank you, Alan and Norma and Nicole uh, and Richard and Michael uh, for kind of getting us started on understanding, you know, how COVID hit um, carceral facilities, how the response, your feelings, what that meant for educational programs. And then we kind of want to shift to uh, looking at um, um, uh, recommendations and, and, and a little bit of, of solutions and understand and, and also understanding a little bit more about like conditions of release. And so uh, I want to start uh, with Nicole. Um, and, and I guess kind of why we want to go with uh, understanding conditions of release is to kind of, um, uh, we bring up this idea of carceral humanism when we're training our volunteers, um, you know, the, the applying uh, punitive logic uh, to uh, to solving problems, and we want our volunteers to avoid carceral humanism. And so, these next like questions are, are trying to understand like what release was like. Um, and so, uh, Nicole, in your bio, you you talk about your work uh, uh, with the uh, New Jersey Prison Watch uh, and to bringing about Senate Bill uh, twenty five nineteen, uh, which you know allowed public health credits. And so, I'm, I'm wondering if you could. Uh, talk to us a little bit about like, your work with uh, with that organization and really like what does the bill mean and like what, what was released like uh, uh, that for that bill? Um, sure. So um, I began um, working with New Jersey Prison Justice Watch while I was in the halfway house. I got connected to them through actually um, a former professor of mine. Um, and um, what I was doing there is I was doing my own grassroots organizing within the halfway house and I was connected to people in three other halfway houses. So I was just trying to gather information on the 
things they were implementing in regards to COVID and how they were going about handling it and um, trying to bring light to that and, you know, um, bringing back that to um, the coalition. And um, we were trying to bring light to how um, dehumanizing it all was. And it wasn't just in one setting or two settings, it was all over. It was the whole criminal justice system. Um, so um, I gathered letters from people and um, and how COVID affected them. And um, I just um, did just other organizing work like that. Um, letters to the media, op-eds, and, um, and even did an interview with the ACLU um, that went live on the COVID bill, um, getting people to write, getting their families to write. We were just like trying, I was trying to organize as many people as I could um, and get people on the outside to advocate because um, with their families and everybody else. Can you hear me good? Okay. Um, so yeah, um, I was just trying to get like people on the outside to listen, our family members and everybody else and um, seeing how important it was and trying to bring light to everything. Um, what was the other part of your question? I'm sorry. So what did like, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the conditions of relief like what 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 did this particular bill legislation do okay um so before this um they had um a covid um bill that came out that um allowed people to be released on um ankle bracelets non-violent offenders this wasn't for violent offenders but um a big population in New Jersey's prison system is violent offenders, people under the 85% law. So a lot of people didn't qualify for that. And um, it left a lot of people out. Not a lot of people were released because of um, that early bill um, from COVID. So um, we wanted to, or the coalition as a whole wanted to extend it to violent offenders and people that were, um, flooding the prison system, which was 85 percenters. And um, so under the bill, um, there's certain criteria that falls and um, people who have violent offenses and are nearing um, a year and uh, 12 months and under for their release were allowed um, emergency health credits. And this would continue on for as long as there was a declared state of emergency in New Jersey. Um, so um, so whenever the state of emergency ends with the pandemic is, is for as long as it's gonna go on. And this bill was supposed or does set precedence for other bills and other pandemics that, ha that may um, or occur in the future. So they have you know, something to go by because this, the pandemic, um, they didn't have a procedure to go by. So this bill set precedence not only for other um, states, but for other pandemics that may occur in the future. Um, so um, people with um, violent offenses that were nearing the end of their sentence were allowed six months, um, well, four months for every six months. So um, with a uh, max of eight months in total. It's a little confusing. <laughs> On a max of eight months in total. So people, it would give them, it will break them down. So people who had a year left on their sentence would be knocked off eight months and it would um, give them eight months of a time earlier to their release. Thank you for that, Nicole. Um, and, uh, and I'm sorry. Um, Richard and Michael, I have a similar question. So Michael, you got a, um, a, a special time credit and then Michael, you were on parole. And so Richard, if you can talk talk about how like your release worked uh, in COVID and then Michael, if you could talk about uh, uh, how your release worked in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely a direct um, beneficiary of those time credits that Nicole was speaking about. Um, the governor signed an executive order to release people before that, that was ineffective. Um, like, it was supposed to release thousands of people, but maybe 100 people were released. They're not even sure how many people were released under executive order. 
So this legislative action was needed to force the state to release people. Um, the original date was set for September, September 13th. And it was the day that we were like 3,000 people out of state of New Jersey were gonna be released. But due to some backlash of what to do with all those people being released at one time, what are the services that's, that they need? It was, they felt it was too rushed. Um, of course, there was the people that didn't want to see us to leave early. Um, their argument was, how can you release so many people at one time? Even though we were all due to be released in a year, because the credits only apply to people that you had been with in a year of the max date. So the eight months credits didn't apply to someone if you had two or three years left. So I was due to be released February 28th. And I left November 4th because of the, the bill. But um, like when I was speaking to my family, like it's like sad also because you know I had a friend that got a COVID while in prison. It's like I'm got released because pe so many people died. I'm I'm happy to be out, but it's only because so many people died that I'm out. Um, New Jersey had um, not sure, but I know I'm pretty sure they had like the highest uh, per capita deaths in the prison system in the country. Not the most death, but per capita. And it was like, like you know what I mean? Eye-opening, like their, their numbers um, don't tell the truth. Like when they tested us for COVID and there was still a lot of positives, they tell us, tested us after the COVID spread throughout the prison and we were all coming up negative, Most, a lot of us. And it still were coming a lot of positive. But um, if, if it wasn't for people like, like Nicole, and I definitely was telling my family to write the governor, write your sen the senator, write the congressman, push these people to, and this was just for the executive order, to amend the executive order to allow people like me, because I wasn't affected by the executive order because of uh, my crime did not fit the criteria of the executive order. So it didn't affect me. And why would I have been included? So the, the bill included almost everyone where it was more fair, more equitable for everyone. And if it wasn't for getting released, like I wouldn't be here today. I still would, you know, be been coming home like a couple weeks ago. So it's definitely like, I see it like, like it's definitely like a blessing, but it's also like a blessing with like, like I said, like a sadness attached to it because so many people died for me to get out. It had to be that so many people died that that to call attention to the fact that this is a dangerous situation that's happening in prison, which is the overcrowding, which is how can we socially distance? Overcrowding has been an issue in prison for a long time. But it was until COVID occurred that, wait, we have to do something about this overcrowding that's happening in the prison system. So it's definitely like, like you know me a little both. Like I'm happy to be out, but I'm also sad that it happened on account of other people that, that, um, that died for me to be out. So it's definitely, you know I mean, it's hard sometimes when I think about it. Michael. Um, so just a little back story of, you know, how parole works here um, and how it works with COVID. <clears throat> um, you basically have to do all your time here in um, PA. There is no reprieve. There is no good time. There's a straight time, um, except for like um, maybe a drug offense and the, the judge might have gave you some type of program that they had for drug offenses. Um, so they did, Secretary Wetzel and Governor Wolf, they were pressured to, to sign something and they allowed people to get out, but it was conditional. And you had, you, you were nonviolent, but it was also conditional. When your time for parole came up, you had to check back, you had to turn yourself back into prison mm -hmm. so you could see a parole board. So you had to come back into the environment of COVID to see a board. Um, so that's just one thing. Um, as far as how it helped the process for me, um, I, I think it was expedited because of um, COVID. Usually the process to get parole and PA takes about seven to eight months and you don't even hear nothing back for months on end um, with me it it was so fast I mean I didn't even get my green sheet and they called my my father asking about 
you know, do he, is he going to approve? Can I come to his house for a home plan? So I didn't even know I was paroled. My dad knew before me, like, um, I mean, I, which made me like ecstatic because when I got on the phone, I'm just another day locked in the cell waiting on my, my green sheet. And my dad said, uh, you got paroled. And I said, well, how you know that? Well, they called. And I was like, and wow. And this was like five days after I saw the board. That never happens. And it happened because of COVID. Um, so is that is it like that for everybody? No, because some people did get denied parole. But for those that went home during COVID, the process was so fast. And you got your response so fast. And they did not even do the things that they normally do, like check if you have a job. They didn't even go to the house to see if the house was livable. They just called the number that was given and basically released you to it. So that told me in my head, the processes that they go through pre-COVID are really like just to throw you through a loop, just to make your life a living hell because they didn't even need to do it. You know what I'm saying? And they trusted me to go out to this number. So um, as far as that goes, yeah, like, getting released in COVID definitely benefited me. Um, am I sad like Richard? Yeah. But, you know, when you talk about getting out of prison, you, you're you selfish. You know what I'm saying? You want to get out. You know what I'm saying? And you don't care how you got out. You know what I'm saying? And I, I, I wish it didn't happen this way, but I do feel like um, it helped me. It, it, it helped me get out. It helped that process because they had to release people. And it's like Richard said, they said that they released people, but they didn't because people were coming up for parole. So these weren't people that they just let out. I still had to go through a process. And Pennsylvania was so bad that they were fudging the records. They weren't even reporting how many people got COVID. It just was out. It just was out in the news. They lied about it. You know what I'm saying? So can you imagine like your family calling and they're not even getting the proper information to what's going on inside of these prisons. But um, yeah, um, definitely uh, helped the process along. Um, I didn't really have to do pre like pre-release or pre-parole type of things. Like as far as going to little classes that you have to go to, that was mixed out. I didn't have to do that. Um, I didn't have to get a bunch of support letters like you normally do. And my interview was, three minutes long, like it was three, I walked in, I sat down, two ladies, they asked me what my name was, asked me, was I ready to go home? And I said, yes, who's going to say no? I said, yes. And she was like, cool, <laughs> stay out of trouble. I said, I, I haven't, I can't get in trouble. I'm locked in myself. You know what I'm saying? So that's how my parole went. So, yeah. So thank you for that, Richard. And, um, and Michael for and, and also Nicole for shedding light on that. Uh, so we have uh, five more minutes left before we go to the um, the Q and A. And so I'm gonna uh, uh, there's two questions. And so I'm just prompting y'all that like to to uh, for brevity. So there's two questions left. I'll ask one, and then uh, Anthony will ask. And so uh, the next question is for uh, for Alan and also for Norma. And so by the beginning uh, by the beginning of the summer or mid summer, like we in the, that, that uh, do prison education or supporting uh, incarcerated folks knew that uh, we probably, we were not going back in uh, in the fall. And so uh, if you could uh, talk uh, like specifically to like what your like organization uh, uh, did uh, for like for programming in the fall and then the organization that you support, like how, how they managed or how they pivoted to continuing to provide educational support. And then uh, after that, we'll, uh, we'll have our last question. So as I mentioned earlier, for our regions where facility partners did not have capacity for virtual programming, we turned to reentry and there were challenges that came uh, with moving into reentry with new partners, such as, um, you know, reentry partners allow us increased access to students, but with the pandemic, we also knew that students were facing new challenges and we needed to prepare our volunteers for these challenges. Um, for example, it's hard enough without the current job market to be, um, you know, facing reentry. Um, and so there were challenges even for students who theoretically had more uh, freedom to attend uh, tutoring. Um, and so it was important um, 
I'm trying to <laughs> keep it a little, a little brief. Um, so with virtual uh, programming, um, some of our students also who hadn't had access to technology for many years, um, we're now facing the challenge of uh, utilizing APDS tablets um, or, um, you know, trying to get everything set up for virtual tutoring. Um, and so at the PD Green program, we had to do our best to troubleshoot with some students who were, um, some of them were using only messaging with us. We didn't have uh, the security clearance to have video tutoring. Um, and so we were, we were doing our best to, to message with them and, and support them with accessing our lectures and our worksheets and all of that. Um, and we had to consider whether we were going to have one-on-one -on -one video tutoring, group video tutoring, um, simply just the messaging when we didn't have access to video. Um, and then we also had to consider uh, what it means for students who were showing up physically and mentally in the pandemic. So we've already heard um, about the, what conditions were like. Um, and so thinking about living in lockdown, losing access to your visitations, to phone calls with family, to communication with your attorneys. Um, so thinking about, um, also with students um, post-release and, and everything that they're facing. Um, so at the in the DC region specifically, um, we originally began to develop a new program at a youth facility that didn't actually work out due to their staff capacity for virtual tutoring. Um, but this led to a separate partnership at a different youth facility in DC called the Youth Services Center. Um, we learned that some of the GED students at the initial facility were transferred to Youth Services Center. And at the time, um, Youth Services Center didn't have the option for a GED track. Um, their students were working towards their high school diploma. And so, um, um, we know, you know, we all know the benefits of for some students to keep to stay on that GED track. And so we were able to offer uh, a virtual one on one video program combined with um, an online platform called Essential Ed, um, which is like a self guided self paced program. And while when combining that with our tutors, um, you know, they had that additional support to help work through problems that, you know, videos online wouldn't have the full capacity to do um, and to build that transformational relationship with our students, which we know is so important. Um, and at the DC jail, we, we developed a college bridge writing course. Um, and this is the, the one that I was mentioning before where we could only message our students. Um, and so we, we decided on a writing program because with messaging, it's pretty challenging to do things like math um, without the ability to share your screen um, or have that video access. Um, and we began to, um, you know, troubleshoot like what might what might be the challenges with messaging. And so we had to support our tutors with anticipating that it might take more time for students to message um, during a live session because they have to navigate back and forth between their written work and the messaging platform itself um, and train our tutors on how to be encouraging and build rapport um, via messaging. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to emphasize that with our current um, virtual learning approach, um, we're making do with technology, but it would be so much better if we could be inside. Um, our intention is to get back inside while continuing to use some of these platforms that are very useful. Um, but we know that those transformational relationships are just all the more um, strong with in-person tutoring. So I'll try to make it quick and luck would have it. I have a chainsaw firing up right outside my window right now. So I apologize if that's distracting anybody. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Norma really got into a lot of the same uh, issues that many of the Second Chance Pell programs had to grapple with. Um, you know, with Second Chance Pell, um, none of the programs were allowed to do correspondence programming or, or pen and paper packets alone. Um, they have to do distance learning, and so that requires electronic component to it. And we all know, you know, how outdated technology is in most prison systems. You know, I'm trying to give you more of a national picture um, rather than the regional picture. So outdated technology or heavily restricted technology. And so, um, you know, many programs just simply had to stop um, and weren't able to continue because of those um, restrictions. Some were able to do the email through like JPEG, GTL in combination with packets. As, as has been already mentioned. Um, a few were able to go, you know, to a video uh, modality and, and utilize, um, you know, synchronous distance learning. Um, in some cases, uh, which was new for them, so it was sort of progress in that, in that way. Um, and then, you know, the programs that were sort of already asynchronous distance through like tablets and that, you know, weren't really affected 
um, as much because they kind of already have that part down. I mean, I think one of the things that hasn't been mentioned that would have been pretty specific to our programs is the financial aid process. So it's already complicated. It's already, you know, barriers are already exacerbated by prison. And then um, with the lack of the ability for people to go in and provide, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, assistance to help people navigate that process for the following year. Cause you know, you have to renew every year, you have to keep people getting enrolled. And so that that's also an additional challenge that happened um, that I would highlight. Um, so, but I, I don't want to take up too much more time. I know you want to get to your questions. And so um, I'll stop now. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Alan and, um, and Norma. So we want, want to go to the audience uh, right, right now. They've placed some questions in Q&A. And so one of the questions uh, is, um, and I'm going to just kind of summarize, was, you know, what was the, the challenge with of the, like the packets? Like what, what was, what did that change? What did that limit? Yeah, kind of, uh, I see Richard, you're smiling. So if you can uh, start us off. Yes, because like I, like I said, I worked in the education department, I, the prison I was at. So I was making the packets. I was the one making the copies, stapling them, putting their names of the students. Um, and it was so difficult because the teachers would give us the pack, the information to put in the packets, but there were different teachers. <clears throat> there was no plan. There was no game plan. One teacher would begin one, one class for decimals maybe, and the next teacher next week will make a packet for fractions. There was no continuum for the students. So the students that were taking the packet seriously were like, wait a minute, I don't, why, why are we jumping to this other topic? I didn't master this other topic yet. Um, there was like a disconnect between the teachers themselves on how to form. Hello. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah, the internet situation. So um, you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. All right. So um, we were able to communicate to, with the students through the packets. Um, sometimes, like I would make like a, a written example, write it out, answer their questions, but nothing beats actually working with a student and sitting down with them. It's just, there's no way to teach certain topics, especially um, dealing with mathematics or certain science topics without being there to explain it or to directly answer the questions when they pop up. Um, yeah, so those packets were, were definitely a challenge for the students. And what, I don't think it was working out too well. And from when I'm speaking to the guys that are still in there, they're still using the packets and it's still working the same way. And it was just a sad way to, of dealing with that situation. I think it needed to be more like a concerted uh, Thank you for that, uh, Richard. Uh, so another question that uh, uh, that came about is uh, when, for those that were incarcerated, uh, like when did the facilities like start getting it right? Like when did, when did you start getting like appropriate PPE or uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's um, as far as PPE, it never got right. Um, it just didn't. Um, we just had masks, and then at night, they would come past and spray just whatever it was, this chemical on the handles, on the phones, and he said that it would evaporate, but we don't know. Um, as far as education goes, to even get education to start being in the package that Richard is talking about, it took at least four months for that to even, you know, start to connect. So you can imagine that the people that may have just started class or, you know, there's different people in different times, periods of their education, they might have forgot everything that they learned prior to the, to the lockdown. And um, so not having the, the packet or whatever it is that they had to learn from, it was at least four months before that even started to get circulated. Same thing with like the re-entry assistance packets. Um, let, to be totally honest with you, um, when you're incarcerated, really um, 
the individuals that are inside with with the different color on are the ones that really run those programs. Just to be honest, um, we run the programs and the the COs or the counselors, they're just there to facilitate watching us just in case we don't do something illegal. So now you just have us locked down and now they have to do the job, but they don't really even know how to do it most of the time. So it was all types of confusion and everything. So. remember the exact time frame that they got it right with the um, PPE equipment and whatnot. But up until I left, they were still only giving two masks and expecting us to wash those and reuse them every day, all day. Um, so, and as far as the re-entry um, stuff goes, um, it made everything harder. Um, you know, we weren't able, like from the halfway houses, we weren't able to go out and get jobs or even people on the inside, like your networking on the inside um, could open a lot of doors for you. You know, never know who you may need or, you know, um, who you may stay in contact with or whatever. And that would help you for reentry on the outside. So it just put up um, more barriers for us um, and made things even harder for us um, upon release, especially with everything being shut down and, you know, lack of resources coming inside um, the system. Thank you for that. So, uh, Alan, um, can you tell us how, okay, I guess, speak to a little bit more about how um, uh, COVID-19 impacted, like, Second Chance Pill and what you think it, um, you know, will look like going forward, not only with this pandemic, but, you know, the the, the the pandemics to come. Yeah, um, well, I mean, it's exciting to be able to say, you know, that despite the pandemic and despite all of this, we were able to still get, um, you know, Pell reinstatement across, across the finish line. Um, and so that's something to look forward to. Um, so we got Pell grants coming for everybody down the road. Um, and, you know, an, another thing too, that it's not necessarily specific to Pell, but like this has pushed um, a lot of corrections departments more towards being open to the use of technology um, out of necessity. Um, I know that's not the case everywhere. And so I only speak to in generalities here, but, um, but it has opened up those possibilities. I know there are cautions around that with, we don't want technology to replace face-to-face interactions with people because those are so important. Um, but they are also really good supplements to high quality education um, that might be more possible and are more possible in many places now. Um, so those those are a couple of things that, that come to mind for me. Uh, so um, I wanted to highlight those things. Um, I, I will note though that you know, although Pell has been reinstated for everybody, that's not going to take effect until 2023. Um, and so, you know, right now it's, it's, you know, people are thinking a lot about strategic planning and implementation um, and starting to shift the conversation from just access to quality and equity and, um, and things like that, um, which is good too. So I'm just trying to highlight some of the silver lining, right? Um, and yeah, so hopefully that answered your question. It does. And so um, I want to ask, this is kind of a summary of the questions uh, that are in there, and then uh, we'll kind of uh, shift. What's the way forward? Um, so, and when I, when I say that, like, how should uh, incarcerated, uh, incarcerated people be prioritized right, uh, during COVID, uh, thinking about vaccinations or educational services, and also like the return home? Um, and like, what should prison education be looking like? Is, is tablets the only, is, is tablets the, uh, the way that we should be going uh, exclusively? So yeah, uh, that's just a, a question to, to the entire panel and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll close out. Well, um, I think first of all, um, staff, they just need to look at those that are incarcerated as human beings, number one. Uh, I'm a human being, so treat me as if you would treat someone in society. Um, they have a lot of technology in prisons now. Um, you could even broadcast it over the TV 
You know what I'm saying? Um, you can give you could the teachers could be in their classroom just like it's going on out here with college. Um, I'm on a Zoom looking at my co- my 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 classes. So um, you could do it the same way. That's that's the way to move forward. But um, the biggest thing is just treat everybody as if they're a human. And um, if you do that, then you'll be able to have some some care and some concern and some compassion that, you know, every life matters and every life counts. Yeah, one thing I fear about the tablets, though, is that, and I'm pretty sure Michael knows, you know, guys that have been in prison know what I'm talking about. Once something gets taken away, it's very hard to be reinstituted. So once in-person classes are taken away, and they say, well, this works on tablets. Why do we need the professors to come in? Why do we need to have in-class sessions? Then they, you know what I mean? Like, I fear for the future that that'll be an issue. Like, of course, we need it now for during the pandemic. But what, what about after? Like, I'm scary. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, because I definitely benefited from the in-person classes. There's no, you know what I mean? To me, there's no comparison. So, like, in, in a prison institution, they definitely look at, well, we, they did it this long without it. They might as well keep on going that way. So it's definitely, I, I, I'm, you know I mean? I'm wary of it. Thank you very much for saying that, Richard. That's like very important, uh, amen. Um, yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, um, what Michael and Richard said were both great. And um, just to add on to that, like um, Michael, um, Michael took the words out of my mouth when um, he said treating people as human. And I think when it comes to whatever kind of implement, implementations or whatever kind of policy that's put it, um, that's implemented in the criminal justice system, I think it should really be founded on, you know, the fact that people incarcerated are humans too. And their um, life should be valued just as if they were um, somebody on the outside. And um, they put two different values on that. And that's a big problem with that, with the um, PPE equipment, with education, with just so many different components of incarceration, um, you know, we're not treated um, with the same value. So um, with that building on that foundation or having that as a foundation, looking at it from a humanities aspect, um, I think will um, help circumstances. And as far as like the in-person learning and stuff, I I can also attest to like, even now being on the outside, I benefited so much from in-person learning. You thrive off of that, like off of other people's opinions, off of, you know, the debates in class, the discussions in class, it really does something to you. It lights a fire in you. Um, there's nothing like it, you know? So, um, whatever um, um, procedures implemented, whether it be through tablets and because, you know, having internet is um, um, not easy to get inside the prison. They don't like it. They don't like for, you know, us to have any more access to the outside world than we already have or um, that's already allotted to us. So um, just maybe even having those tablets uh, educate for education and whatever kind of restrictions we put on them or whatever to make, you know, um, education still accessible within the confines of, you know, the institution or whatnot. But um, maybe something should also be said that this is like um, whatever, you know, However, it goes about being said, maybe it should just be something that said just for now. Like these are during the pandemic. Maybe, you know, wording is um, very powerful. So, whatever kind of wording is put in the document, it should be during the pandemic. So that once the pandemic ceases or once, you know, things are able to operate in person again, people are still able to get that um, interaction that they thrive off. So uh, thank you both uh, to, to, to Michael, Nicole, and Richard for uh, those powerful um, uh, words uh, to close us out. Uh, we're gonna uh, share our screen again and, uh, and uh, share some uh, information before we go about our survey and 
uh, donation. And so uh, thank you to all of our panelists. And so uh, we have a uh, our next webinar and our last webinar for the for the semester is called Defund, Decriminalize, and Abolish. What do it really mean? It's on April 7th at 4 p.m. Uh, please uh, go use tinyurl.com slash what do they mean uh, to go ahead and register for that, or you can also go on our website. We'll be putting the uh, uh, the panelist name um, next week, and I'm really excited about this one. Uh, then also uh, next, uh, so we uh, when you when this um, webinar uh, closes out, uh, there's going to be a, a survey that pops up. Please uh, complete this survey for us. It helps us determine like well, not only uh, give us feedback on what we're doing, but also helps us understand like what we should be doing more of. And then lastly. Uh, uh, we, uh, the money that we get uh, for our programs uh, goes to support the educational goals of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated learners. And so uh, we are asking you to invest in justice education. We're able to do this uh, based off of your, uh, uh, like your support. And so, you know, you can give a little or give a lot, uh, but we rely on community support to do this type of work, uh, this education, not only for our volunteers, but for the broader community uh, so that they can understand, you know, the context which produce uh, incarceration, the non-folk education, and um, and uh, that of uh, uh, that uh, you know makes it uh, easier for uh, folks to get education. So please support us. Uh, you can go to our website uh, and click on donate or Venmo. Use PD Dash Green Program. All right. And so we'll uh, thank you to all of our our panelists. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for moderating. And then for everyone uh, that, that showed up and hung out with us, thank you for your questions. Uh, please uh, uh, listen to this music and then uh, complete the, uh, the survey for us.